Autosave. My name is Camille Selzer Hadaway, and I'm here with my co host, Mr. Nick Andrade, who was just putting up and putting down the blinds. I don't know what you were doing, Nick. That was really weird. I was putting down the blinds because we record this video where we see each other so we can properly yeah. have dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that my windows were open, so there was a very big glare on my forehead. And I feel like it would distract you and blind you. So I, I just made sure to tone it down. Thank you for toning that down. But I really just feel like you should tell the people the truth. You were closing your blinds because you're secretly a vampire and the light was getting to you. I wish. I wish I was a vampire. <laughs> If I was immortal and had fangs, that'd be amazing. Mm, that sounds like a vampire trying to convince me that you're not a vampire by showing that you want to be a vampire. I don't know. I don't trust it. <laughs> and there's a lot that I don't trust in Rapture because it is a sick and twisted world. But guess what? We are still adventuring through with our playthrough of Bioshock on the last episode. <laughs> You ooze in like an assassin, and then you try to sneak out like a thief. You're no CIA spook. Who are you? Why have you come here? There's two ways to deal with a mystery. Uncover it, or eliminate it. <laughs> Atlas had us go to Fontaine Fishery to meet Peach Watkins, where the remains of a submarine were. Peach was very untrusting of Jack, but truthfully, we were rightfully untrusting of him because he ended up double crossing us and tried to kill us. But instead, we killed him. Also, we learned more about what seems to be three major groups in Rapture, led by Atlas, Andrew, Ryan, and Fontaine, who had different visions, I guess, of what Rapture would be or may have ended up working together and then had a falling out. We also found out that Atlas's wife and kid were in that submarine in Fontaine's fishery, and we finally met Atlas, or at least we saw him. Or at least we think it was him. Atlas tried to get his family out of the submarine uh, because they were trapped in there. But then they were killed via explosion, a submarine explosion, all caused by Andrew Ryan because he found out that we were helping Atlas. I'm betting that things are just going to get a little bit crazier in this episode as we dive into chapters five to seven, Arcadia Farmer's Market and Arcadia Revisited. But of course, we start off... Just how Nick likes to start these episodes off with a question of the day. And Nick, we found out that there's these like three main factions or these groups in Rapture that just keep getting talked about. We have Andrew Ryan, Atlas, and now Fontaine. So my question to you, given what we know already of these all crazy people, in my opinion. Yeah. If you lived in Rapture and you had to choose to follow one of them, which one would you choose? Well, first of all, I would have never moved to Rapture. <laughs> I know I have to answer the question, which I will, but I can honestly say without a doubt that no one would have swayed me to move to Rapture, regardless of what my life looked like at the time. What if they give you a big old bag of money? What if Andrew Ryan's like, hey, you'll be a millionaire in Rapture? No, because I can't swim and I f would foresee myself dying ah. in Rapture because being underwater. I just feel I would feel uneasy about that. But anyway, <laughs> your your question, I would go where the money is, obviously. Oh, no. And where the power is. And I still feel... I still feel, despite everything that Atlas is trying to do, I would go with Andrew Ryan because he has all the power and he literally just blew up Atlas's family. So <laughs> there is no lengths that Andrew Ryan would not go to secure Rapture with his power. So to be honest, I always think about it like the rebels in Star Wars, right? Yeah. You, everyone wants to be a rebel. Everyone wants to be Luke. Yeah. But if push comes to shove, are you really a Luke or are you actually <laughs> just a commander in the Empire? Because I'm going to call you on your bullshit <laughs> if you think that you're always going to want to be a rebel. You're probably going to take the money and run. 
So you're taking all the power and like wanting to be with Andrew Ryan, who will do anything to get anything done. I also sidebar uh, with you, Mm -hmm. the listeners, not you, Nick. Stop listening. Oh, sorry. I'll plug my ears. Nick's kind of crazy because he was laughing at the fact that he blew up Atlas's family? Yeah. That is crazy. I think you chose right, Nick. Just based on that alone, I think you chose right for you. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I trust you anymore. Well. And you know what? I've been I, some of your some of your choices that you or your opinions on Rapture have been on point. Yes, we agree. It probably smells really musky in there. But then some of them, I'm just like, uh, your your villain story is coming out right now. This is the game. Well, no, I, I'm just trying to survive, Cam. That's all I'm trying You're to You're trying do. to survive by laughing at this poor man's family that got blown up. Like if you were with Andrew Ryan and you were following him at this moment, you'd be in the background and like be spying on Atlas going up to the submarine, seeing it explode. And you'd be like, ha, ha, and then report back to Andrew Ryan. Yeah, they're dead. They're all dead. I tell you, they're dead. First of all, you don't trust anybody. OK, so your your, your credibility is is lowering in stock because you, you're just not trusting anybody. Yeah. But at the same time, we both don't trust Atlas. No. OK. And we both think that this submarine explosion was some sort of ruse. Mm-hmm. OK, we're, we're fishy by it. So all, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Atlas seems like a crummy guy as well. And especially he's like bossing us around. Yeah. And as we go into this episode, he's going to boss us around some more. So I'm not really <laughs> liking. Andrew Ryan is kind of just always asking like who we are. And he's also t- telling us to stay out of his business. Yes. He's warning us, right? He's warning us. That's right. When you think about it, Atlas has not warned us that it's like, ooh, Andrew Ryan's going to come for you. It's going to get messy. But we fell into this and doing chores for him. And all we wanted to do was leave. And that's exactly why I did not choose Atlas myself. But I also didn't choose the insane Andrew Ryan because he's also killing people left and right that are working for him. Um, So I don't trust that. Obviously. Who I do trust is Fontaine. I like the idea of being a smuggler, of making things happen like Fontaine holds the real power. Andrew Ryan, we have yet to really see him. And I feel like, wait, wait no, <laughs> no, let me, you were going for the power and I'm going, you know, like there's the people that have the power in quotations, but then there's the people that get things done for the people that have the power yeah. and they have the yeah. real control. And that is Fontaine. Okay. He's a smuggler. He's willing to make things happen. He could undercut Andrew Ryan and Andrew Ryan wouldn't even know about it. And that is why I'm with Fontaine, because he's a smart guy. I already know it. And he's dead. So there's also an opportunity okay. to become the leader. That's what I was going to say. There's one little <laughs> snag is that Fontaine is dead. Yeah. And when Fontaine dies, so does all his power. No, it does not. Because if I was his second in command, okay, people would look to me to keep the smuggling life alive with Fontaine's vision, and I'd totally play that. Okay. I'd be like, yeah, Fontaine really wanted us to like plant strawberries. And then I'd be like, yeah, all the strawberries are going to me. Ha <laughs> ha. I don't see you as the mobster type. I also just said my grand scheme would be to plant strawberries so then I could just eat them all. <laughs> you definitely would be overthrown very quickly. <laughs> but the same thing, too, is Fontaine, in one of the audio diaries last week, we hear that he is like a worse torturer than Andrew Ryan. People are scared of him. People would be scared of me. I'm second in command. Would they or would they just try to overthrow you because all you wanted to do was eat strawberries? Well, you know what? We would never know because this is a hypothetical question. <laughs> the only thing that we know out of it is I guess we're really not good people when it comes down to it because our whole thing is like we both were going for the power just in different avenues to get there. I really want to see what people would choose because you could all fine and dandy say that you'd want to be a rebel, okay? And you want to roll with Atlas and try to overthrow some sort of government. Yeah. But until you do it, like, let's let's see. Let's pen your name down, but let's see if you actually do it. So pretty much what Nick is saying is um, we're all horrible people. Yes. Yeah, and he's a bully. 
No, we're not. No, 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 no. We're not moving on to segment two. I am not a bully. Uh, okay, okay. Nick is not a bully for the record. He just has bully-like qualities that uh, are coming out in this video game. Yes. But you know what? Rightfully so, because emotions are high. You have Atlas, who's now mourning over his family's death. Andrew Ryan, who maniacally laughed at us and said that, like, you're going to learn while blowing up Atlas's family. And then Fontaine, uh, who's apparently dead. So hopefully we'll get some answers right after the break as we continue our journey in Bioshock and go to Arcadia. You came to rob what you could never build. The hum gaping at the gates of Rome. Even the air you breathe sponged from my account. Well, breathe deep. So later you might remember the taste. <laughs> you get to the bathosphere in the rolling hills. That'll take you straight to the devil himself. And then, all debts will be paid in full. So, Atlas is unhinged. You know, his family's dead. He's really, I guess, going through all the emotions of grief and in full revenge mode. Like, fully in revenge mode. He is ready to go for Andrew Ryan and to pay all debts, uh, which is very sinister-like. And we never really heard... Atlas talk like this. So we're seeing this kind of reversal between Andrew Ryan and Atlas, where Andrew Ryan seems less unhinged, more in control of the situation because he just took something close to Atlas, whereas Atlas may be losing the reason why he's doing the things that he's doing going against Andrew Ryan. I also feel like Atlas may be getting a little bit paranoid. He, well, not paranoid, but I, I just question, like, when he's talking about we, we will take his heart out. We will do all this. We will do all that. Again, where did Jack sign up to all yeah, this Like, stuff? there's no we. And Jack, like, speak up for yourself, buddy. Like, I'm trying here. I don't know what's going on, but he's, like, he's literally deranged and unhinged. And I also just want to point out, an Irish man's kid's name was Patrick. Hmm, suspicious. Suspicious. Couldn't think of another name. Hmm? Patrick, Irish Patrick. Interesting. Yeah, they're like, what's a good uh, Irish name for a son? Hmm. Patrick. There we go. I'm I'm surprised like their last name's not like O'Reilly. It looks like they were just going for like the stereotypes of like Irish names. Do you even know what Atlas's last name is? Actually, that's a good question. I don't think I, I remember hearing that. It's probably Atlas O'Hooligan or something. Oh, we should put up like a bet. It, will it be... <laughs> Hooligan, or will it be O'Reilly? Well, we'll have to see if we ever learn his last name. But yeah, we have this where like he's including us in this revenge. And yes, it is sad he lost his family. But quite frankly, we're still just trying to survive and get out of Rapture. And I don't think Atlas is thinking of us at all. So I feel like everything that's to come in this mission is just going to be like, his story. It's not leading to us leaving Rapture or trying to escape it, which is so frustrating because we didn't even want to be here in the first place. Now we have to head through the tea garden. And honestly, this first Houdini splicer yep. that shows up in the tea garden was not expecting, freaked me out right away. I really do hate how they pop up and then disappear and then they lead you deeper and deeper into whatever area you are and then they just pop up and then start 
messing with you. Well, if you just shoot them, they're like blood splatters. Yes. But then they come back into form. I don't know how exactly they work. I don't know either. I was prepared. Like, I thought this was a boss fight at the beginning because, you know, this lady is whispering at you. And then keeps like coming at you, but then disappears. So I'm like, uh oh, what is this thing? Yeah, I was like, oh, we're going, we're going there. And then once you kill the splicer, you realize it's a Houdini splicer. But I was under the assumption that it was like something more grandiose. And then I'm like, oh God, this is just a regular splicer that we're going to have to deal with. Not okay. Not okay. I'll Also, why can't we get that power? What plasmid do I need to be able to appear and disappear and reappear? And that's so cool. That's really cool. Um, Anyways, as you continue through, you'll take out some more splicers and have another encounter with a big daddy. And of course, be a good person and harvest. I mean, save the little sister. I still have yet to harvest a little sister. I'm too afraid to do it. Every time you get to that point, it's just I don't know how you feel, but I'm just I just can't do it. I can't I can't harvest it. Or her, sorry, not it. She's a little (laughs) sister. My thing is like, no, I'm going to do it this time just to see. And then when she's like, no, don't. I'm like, okay, I won't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. (laughs) So you have to continue through uh, this area to the grotto and you'll see like electric wires set up that kind of block your path. Just shoot them off the wall. Um, That's how I got rid of them. I did learn later on that you're apparently supposed to use telekinesis. That's a smart way to do it. But I did not do that. I used the weapons instead. I don't know why. <laughs> no, because I, I feel like those kind of things, too, are not a little too smart for us. But when you have to, like, do a strategy mm-hmm. with a power, I feel like I'm not really. Uh, apart from, like, electrocuting the splashes in water, mm-hmm. I feel like that's the only thing that I know how to do properly. That's the only thing. The only thing you know how to do properly, Nick. Yes. Give yourself more credit. Now, before we continue through to the farmer's market, you'll have an opportunity to get buff with different tonics because there's a gene bank there. And then uh, we'll have, there's there's like this little boss battle or something. Like when I, I felt this gene, this gene bank was in the corner and I'm like, oh, they're prepping us. There's like going to be a boss yeah. battle coming up or, or something's going to happen. And then, and then we continue. I'm just feeling like there's no boss battles. Well, that's the thing. We continue and then there's no boss battles. But we do hear from someone familiar. On the surface, I once bought a forest. The parasites claimed that the land belonged to God and demanded that I establish a public park. I did so the rabble could stand slack-jawed under the canopy and pretend that it was paradise earth. Congress moved to nationalize my forest. I burnt it to the ground. God did not plant the seeds of this Arcadia. I did. Okay, so Andrew Ryan apparently also isn't an environmentalist. <laughs> what an a-hole. Like, he's just the... When you thought he couldn't get worse. No. He gets worse. He is like a pure capitalist, too, where he said, like, they wanted to nationalize my park. I couldn't have that happen. It's like, oh, boy. Okay. And again, I'm I'm not going to fight a battle here between capitalism and socialism, but you can see very much he is a 1960s capitalist at art. Yeah. And you know what? If he can't have it his way, well, guess what? He'll literally burn it to the ground. <laughs> and like, that's the crazy thing. It's like, because something that's more powerful than him, like the government or potentially God, which the people of this land believed in. He's just like, no one's stronger than me. If I can't have it, no one can. And burns this forest to the ground. What a baby move. Oh, yeah. I mean, big time. But especially now, back to your question of the day, like, man, maybe it's not a good idea to side with Ryan because he (laughs) seems like a a psychopath. He is. He is. You would have been dead already. If you were in his crew, he would have been like, did you breathe too hard? (laughs) Like, that'll cost you. That'll cost you. He just seems like a type who, I, I don't know, It's a, he'd rather burn Rapture to the ground than mm. see it flourish. Yeah. Which is bizarre. And that's the weird thing, too, because it's supposed to be his haven. Yes. He invited these people to live in Rapture. And now he's just tormenting them, but doesn't see it as torment. Sees it as free will. When truthfully, he's just looking for his own free will and not for the free will of everyone. 
when you think about it. And then we learn, obviously, that he destroyed Arcadia's greenery after we hear a recording of him boasting about it because the trees were messing with the oxygen or like, I guess the trees were providing oxygen yeah. to Rapture because that's something we didn't even think about when we we're like, would you live in Rapture? We were concerned with the carpets. What about oxygen? We never thought about how is Rapture getting oxygen. And I never thought it was through trees planted down there. But apparently Me neither. that's what they were doing. <laughs> and he wanted to like, like, I don't know. He He's just wanted, again, to have control over it. So he burns down these trees. Um, and we find out that Julie Langford, who may be alive, uh, was working with Andrew Ryan as a botanist and planted Arcadia and tried to save it or will do anything to save it. So my thing is, like, if Rapture has gone to crap, right, we learn about this whole story of this greenery in Arcadia and how it's so important to the people there. Yeah. If it's been burnt down, why do I care to help them? Because Atlas does ask us to help kind of restore this when I'm just trying to get out of here. And I feel like this is my question throughout these chapters. I'm just trying to leave I don't want to save these plants. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know why. Like, again, this is a video game, so we know we're going to keep going forward with the story. But in a realistic level of Jack, like, we don't see any of his reasons as to why he's still here. We don't really know this character at all, really. We're just kind of just, like, going around doing what Atlas says. And it's strange now because... Again, I, the for, the whole purpose at the beginning was to try to escape. Mm -hmm. Then he's like, no, I need to save my family. And so like, okay, we'll save your family. And now he's just like, he's taking us further and further along the road into what? Just now revenge for him. We're, we're not justified in that battle at all because we have no idea why they are fighting. Yeah. So it's just like, I need to know more about Jack's story to kind of really understand what I'm doing here. As we've seen like those flashes and screams of like his family and pictures. So I feel like there's they're like leaning to something. But what the hell that is, I have no idea. That's why, like, I feel like I do have this disconnect with Jack where it's like Andrew Ryan, Atlas, like their stories are interesting. Even Fontaine, like who we still don't know a lot about, but who I would side with because I just find his story so interesting as a smuggler. But Jack, I'm just like. Hmm, he just goes with the flow, apparently, like he has nothing to lose. I feel like this could have been explained a little better because I thought maybe, oh, they need the tree's oxygen in order to like continue breathing in rapture as it is. That is not what is explained, uh, especially when we learn about Julie, who's a botanist. It's Atlas literally says something along the lines of Julie will be so pissed that Arcadia is burnt down and she'll want to help. I don't know. This whole situation is all weird. Uh, but we have to head to the research laboratories to find Julie. My trees. It wasn't you, was it? No. Ryan. I think I've got a way to save the trees. It's a genetic vector that... Oh, look who I'm talking to. Could you find a sample of Rosa Gallica for me? Look in the grotto. No offense to the citizens of Rapture. But you know what? Actual offense to them. Like when we come across someone new and they're asking Jack slash me for a favor, they have no manners about it. Like they can't be a little bit polite about it. <laughs> like you are locked away, Julie, in this like little you're on a screen. You're in the labs locked away and you're asking for us to find this, you know, Rose of Gallica in order to bring Arcadia back to life. And you're so condescending about it. It really makes me not want to help you. And especially, once again, as a character that we've never seen before. <laughs> so Tannenbaum, I think, is the only person who has come to, like, say something to us. Mm -hmm. Apart from, I guess, Peach Wilkins, yeah. who, <laughs> who was behind that door before he tried to kill us. But, yeah, everyone seems to be, like, far away, not in the action, hiding from something, and then telling us to do things. And then being rude about it. It's just very strange. It's so strange. Like, wouldn't you want to, like, butter me up a little bit to have me agree to help you with your endeavors? I don't know. Maybe this is just me being 
a little bit whiny because I'm annoyed at Rapture that I'm still in this world with Jack. Uh, But you know what? We are going to help Julie here because we have to find the Rose of Gallica to help save Arcadia. So we head back to the grotto and this is where we find uh, the Rose by the watermill. I almost missed it because it, it's actually truly beautiful. Uh, this the watermill or water wheel. I don't even, is it a watermill? I don't even remember, but it's in the center of the room. There's like a little spotlight on it and there's all these like uh, roses and you pass this before when you're heading to the laboratory. Yes. Um. So it was just kind of cool that we had to go to it. And like when you go up to the roses, you could actually pick one. I found that cool. The scenics are really nice in this. Again, like if you play the remaster version, you can kind of see Arcadia in all its glory. And uh, it's it's really fascinating. So we pick a rose, we head back to the laboratory and Julie's really excited we got it. Um, so we have to put it in this device called uh, the Numo, And it's just like a little trash can. And because Julie's like locked in her office, I guess this just sends it to her. But then she also allows us to go into the lab. Which I'm just like, I could have just given it to you then. Like I didn't need to put it into the Nemo. I guess it's uh, maybe you'll relate to this, but because you don't trust anybody, mm-hmm. this is kind of like Julie doesn't trust anybody at this point right now, which I understand because, you know, Rapture's going to shit. There's a bunch of splicers everywhere. Yeah. So I'm guessing that that's the reason that's like she doesn't want to see us right away. And then we show her and prove to her that we can trust her. And then she lets us in. Okay, that's fine. She lets us in. That's fine. She's making sense now. So we head into the (laughs) lab and here we hear Ryan reminding. He's saying that he's going to remind Julie of her deal with him because apparently like I said, Julie was working with Ryan as botanist and they have this deal which means that Ryan has the rights to anything that Julie grows and he could do with them or all these trees as he please. So she technically, based on this deal, can't do anything to stop him. And I mean, she really can't do anything to stand up to Ryan, especially for him destroying Arcadia, because he ends up killing her via toxic gas in her laboratory. (laughs) Like he didn't even give her a chance To change her mind. He reminded her to stick to the deal just to kill her anyways. And it's sad because once again, she's one of the only actual humans left, I guess, in in, in Rapture. Sane humans? Sane quotations? Yeah, she's not spliced. Although the graphics kind of look weird where I thought she was spliced. But then I had to look online to take a look at a picture of her. I mean, yes, she she was still intact as a human and not a splicer. But... Uh, that was one of the, again, I, I I started to trust her there at the end there. She seemed like one of the only normal people in Rapture. And then, of course, Andrew Ryan had to gas her. Mm-hmm. And then it was a really creepy scene. It was. Uh, seeing her die. Yeah, it was like a long, drawn out death where she's like up against the glass uh, in her laboratory. And we're on the other side, locked out of the room. And she's <laughs> slowly... <laughs> I don't know. I I was laughing, although it's not. You're laughing. Because, okay, so she's drawing numbers on the glass because the toxic uh, gas happened to fog up the glass. Yeah. So we can't really see. And she's taking her hand and drawing these numbers. And all you hear is, like the squeakiness of her doing it. And I was just like, this is hilarious. How? (laughs) She's literally dying, and in her last <laughs> breath, she's doing the famous, tr- like, we see it in movies all the time, where they yeah. scroll something on a fogged glass. Yeah. I thought it was really creepy and effective, and I really enjoyed it. Really? It was so drawn out. And I think that's why I was laughing, because it wasn't just like, Ew. Because it was but, so long. She yeah. was, it was, what was it, four or five? It was four numbers. Four numbers, but like big numbers. And like you're hearing. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, this is, this is like something out of a movie. So this is not ending. Um, it's kind of like, you know, remember that movie, The Mask, when he fake dies and he keeps coughing in The Mask? Wait, in the Jim Carrey one? Yeah. When he's like, tell mama I love him. and then, yeah, Oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, yeah. kind of what it reminded me. Yeah, it seemed like that just because of the squeakiness and like how it was just going on forever. But yes, it is sad. Julie's dead. <laughs> is it? Is it? Okay. May she rest in peace. 
um, in the rapture heavens. Um, and yeah, you know, we do get these numbers that are on the glass. And the cool thing is she did leave us with a little hint here because you could use those numbers to get the vault, uh, get into her vault. And in the vault, you uh, get a recording and also a key that allows you access to the farmer's market. The recording, though, is pretty interesting because it tells you about this Lazarus vector that can help restore Arcadia and how we have to make it. So what we need is seven distilled waters, seven enzyme samples, and seven chlorophyll solutions. And apparently the enzyme samples are literally like bee spit, uh, which I just found. But I do love a good scavenger hunt quest. I really do. I didn't even know that bees could spit, to be honest. Why wouldn't they be able to spit? I mean, that's what creates honey, right? Or something? I don't know. Is that what creates honey? This is not a scientific... Yes, but we do not have lab cups. We are not uh, scientists, <laughs> but I mean, hey, maybe that's how honey is produced. What we do know is that we have to go to the farmer's market because Atlas lets us know we'll find some of the items there. And it also brings these flashbacks that you were talking about, Nick, to something in Jack's past or like are these visions? We're still very unsure about like what these are but what we do see it's black and white and it's a farmhouse yeah i uh i watched it back a few times to see if there was any little tidbits i could find from it but uh no it's just a couple pictures of a farmhouse and some screams in the background that we heard yeah the last time we kind of saw photos in front of us so i'm trying to like figure out like what the hell this means for jack and and everybody, but I still have no idea his story. They're slow playing this one because uh, I can't figure out like what these things are. We've only seen it a couple times. What does this mean for Jack? I have no idea, but it's making me really curious. I like this kind of mystery. The mystery of it all. Uh, yeah, it is. It is cool. And they're all in black and white, right? Yeah. <laughs> Or sepia. You, or, or oh, yeah. Black okay, okay sepia, fine. Sepia, whatever, but, yeah. No, but why? What's the. Why? Because I didn't realize. Like, are they photos? Because I was like, oh, they're memories. But now that they're probably photos that he looked in, like, he's remembering from an album. Yeah, that's. Yeah, it's like, are you remembering this situation or are you remembering the photos? Yeah. Right? The photos are coming clearly in your mind. Like, why Why is that the case rather than an actual, like, memory? Yeah. It's a good point. Good point. Yeah, I didn't think about it because, like, in my head, I'm just like, oh, these are memories. But, like, even the pictures, they're pictures of his family or of his parents, right? Yeah. And now this farmhouse. So very interesting that he only keeps seeing pictures. Anyways, we keep going into the Arcadia area and you'll find a body on the ground. This one is easy to miss because I miss this one. Uh, You'll find this body on the ground and you could go up to the body and take the enzyme samples from the body. Like when you loot it. Yes, but it's all it's all random too, right? Like, I don't know which ones I like which. Well, when you when you immediately go and like go back to Arcadia, there's like the body there. Yeah. And that's pretty much all the samples. Wait, they're all around the same area? No. When you loot the body. Yeah. The samples are there. Oh, as I was saying, like, don't they also drop from splicers that you kill? Yes, they do. They do. Yeah. Okay. And that's the thing. You could also find like the distilled water as well as the chlorophyll from other splicers in the area. But I mean, like, if you do it that way. It's going to take some time uh, to get everything because it's yeah. more like randomized. But like this one body on the floor has the enzyme samples. I didn't know. So you can miss it. And then we have to continue to the farmer's market. Julie, my dear, I am trying to run a business here. You want to spend time with my honeybees? Well, I'm going to have to start charging you for the pleasure. If I come out one more time and find you lolling out there amongst my hives, I'm grabbing my shotgun. As to your question, yes. My days in beekeeping school are a blur, but I do seem to remember something about that enzyme you keep blabbing on about. The enzymes. Okay, so uh, we head to the farmer's market and we learn about Tasha, who's keeping like the whole get off my lawn stereotype alive, jokingly, I'm guessing, uh, as she's threatening to shoot Julie, uh, who's obviously interested in all the bees that Tasha's keeping. I I just love that. She's like, I will shoot you. Like, like yeah. that, that is normal to say in a rapture that hasn't gone fully crazy, I guess. Where's the cops? Is there any <laughs> cops here in rapture? Or is there the police? Yeah. I feel like there needs to be some law and order here yeah. in, uh, in rapture. It's not just like the whims of people. 
<laughs> it's the whims of people, apparently, even when Rapture is not in full chaos. Anyways, in this area, we're going to find uh, more of those B enzymes or, like I said, the B spit which I like saying it like that. Quick side note as well. When you go into certain areas and you see like where the bees are being kept, the splicers keep getting attacked by the bees. And I love that. (laughs) That's revenge at its fullest. And I think, you know, like how I said I would join Fontaine and Fontaine's known for his torture. I would totally use bees as a way of torturing people. Did you get attacked by bees at all? Yes, I did. And it was hell. How many times did you, how many times you, cause they, they start seeing you for a long time, they but how do. many times did you get attacked? I think probably like three times because I learned, uh, if you go into certain rooms, there's like a smoke switch yeah. that you could turn on and that could actually alleviate, like kind of distract the bees or kill them. I don't know what it does exactly, but then the bees don't attack you. When I was playing this, I... Ran into the bees once, but then I learned my lesson. And again, you see the smoke. You kind of like are able to loot, whatever. But we have Chris playing the autosave gameplay. Mm -hmm. And watching him play was hilarious because he kept getting attacked by bees. Mm, Yeah. And then when he used the smoke, every time, like he would wait until the last second. Yeah. Where the the, because there's an alarm that tells you that the smoke is going to disappear, I guess. Mm -hmm. And every time he almost got caught. With within like the bee traps and then a bunch of splices as well. So I was laughing at his gameplay because it seemed like he wasn't learning his lesson from all the bees. Or maybe Chris just likes the pain. I think he does. If you watch his gameplay, <laughs> he gets attacked quite a bit. Yes, he does. Especially with the splicers. They're coming at you from all different areas. When you feel like you're all alone, bam, splicer from the right side, bam, splicer from the left, everywhere. You never know where they're hitting you from because you might get attacked from one splicer on one side and then you see the damage meter hitting you from another and you have to like whip around and see, oh God, there's three different splicers here. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? But yes, if you could see a splicer get attacked by bees, please just watch for a while. It's really satisfying. Yes. There's also, uh, like we mentioned, a lot of splicers in this area, a couple big daddies as well. Uh, but once you attack them, you'll find uh, chlorophyll, especially from the Houdini splicers. Ugh. Yeah, of course, it's the Houdini splicers that we got to get them from. Yes. The hardest splicers in the game. And the hardest ones and the, and the creepiest. They are really the creepiest as well. Yeah, not even close. There's the one that's like, Mom, are you there? Mom, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm like, mom, I'm like, oh my gosh, where are you? Like, so creepy. Yeah, you'll also find like some distilled water lying around. Uh, so just battle it out. The other thing as well, the splicers with the machine guns. I cannot. I cannot. They, there's no reason they should have a machine gun. I mean, I mean, this is rapture. OK, everyone seems to have guns. Murder seems to be legal. My first encounters with the splicers with the machine guns, I was just like, why is this allowed? Like, because again, splicers appear out of nowhere. And then you're like, I'm being shot from somewhere and it's taking a lot of health. Like, where's this coming from? So uh, I don't like that at all. It's usually from like so far away too. Yes. And their accuracy is incredible. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God, just get out of here. This is where you want to use like a bazooka. Yeah. And just like blow them to some of their ease. <laughs> Would really be cool in this situation if we were able to do like the whole matrix thing and like freeze the bullets with our telekinesis and like throw it back at them. But uh, that doesn't happen. Well, we kind of can with grenades, yes. but we can't do it with bullets. But that would be cool, too. It would be really cool. Bioshock 4. Make it happen. Make it happen and bring back the bees because I like the whole Nicolas Cage moment. <laughs> but yeah, I did get murked by some bees uh, in the uh, area where they're kept. And then you do have to use that smoke uh, switch to distract them, Chris. So, you know, for next time. So you keep heading through to the winery. And this is where you're going to find a lot of distilled water if you haven't collected enough from splicers. Um, you also find electric trap wires. So watch out. And again, apparently telekinesis is the right way to do it. Or just shoot them off the wall. That's how I like to do it. Uh, You also want to watch out for the top floor because there is the photographer's eye tonic. And once you grab that, it'll actually trigger a bunch of splicers to try to get into the room uh, where that's kept. But then you could actually just use electroshock on the water that's outside the room and then get rid of them, which also very satisfying. That's one thing I'm really liking about the game. All the plasmid powers 
are so, so good to use. Like you just get that great feeling from using them. I think it's just like switching them in and out that I find kind of annoying a little yeah. bit because one, you can't have every until you unlock every slot yeah. of plasmids. You can't have every power. So you have to like pick and choose once you get into the vending machines. But it is very fun. It is. So how was your search for these items? Did you find everything you needed? I was thinking of you while I was doing this because I feel like you were having as hard of a time as I am. Yes. Or as I was because no arrows anymore, right? It doesn't tell you where to go, where to find them. You just have to go and explore and find them yourself. And it took a while. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. And and there was a few times where there were so many splicers and I just kept killing them and and trying to find these and i and i couldn't i managed to do it after a while but it is kind of uh, tedious because no one really tells you i think there are some clues yeah there's some clues and also i mean there's a map you could refer to sure but <laughs> how many times did i look at the map not many okay so that's my own fault i guess so nick would definitely hang out with andrew ryan and also does not use maps just if you're keeping track here uh well what's you- <laughs> <laughs> what what those two those two have how are they related i mean you're complaining about the fact it was hard to find things yet we had a map yeah so then but i i get it i get it. it's okay it's, it's, it's okay i get it i get it But once you have all the items, you do circle back to the research lab by passing through the farmer's market. And we hear Andrew Ryan just pretty much (laughs) send a whole bunch of bots our way. So you have to take them out. And I'm really annoyed at all the security bots that we have to deal with because I feel like they are becoming just the tougher ones to deal with. Because sometimes I pass them and I don't realize that they're there. I set the alarm off and uh, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, I, I hate the drones are the worst. Oh, yeah, they, they really are. Because how often are you looking up in the sky? And they make that stupid sound. Yes. <laughs> Whatever, however it is. <laughs> like every time, because it's just like, oh, come on. Like, why? Like, just leave me alone, uh, man. What was, the, what was that sound again, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they make that sound, but sure. I don't know how, uh, how the alarm goes, but yeah, they 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 do make an annoying sound, and uh, that was a decent impression of it. But once we take them out, we have to head, like I said, back to the research lab, and there we're pretty much going to find a U invent machine to put all these ingredients together, and then use the Lazarus vector to save Arcadia. Now, I'm a woman of science, but I'm also a woman who's not afraid of turning a buck or two. Ryan said if I could boost profits in Arcadia, part of the up would ride on my hip. So I get to thinking, we're paying for oxygen when we got photosynthesizing trees. Hell, we can even sell the extra to the rest of the city and undercut the other guys. Ryan will like that for sure. Fontaine's people have moved into the O2 biz tooth and claw. So on our way back to the lab, we hear this recording. And I'm starting to think that Julie Langdon's death was long overdue. How is it that you're going to charge people for oxygen? Like, even if Andrew Ryan's telling you this, you're just like, this is brilliant. (laughs) This is the case where where the money goes, right? You think that you want to be a hero, but in the case of Julie, who is a very smart botanist, she still goes where the money is and she knows like we could charge double for this oxygen. And it's so funny to hear her say like, oh, and Fontaine's in the O2 business. It's like, again, like we're living in this dystopian, it's 1960, yet it's, you know, already in a dystopian yeah. context here where people are buying oxygen in rapture. It's like, why did you move here in the first place if that's the case? I know. And that's the thing. It's supposed to be this haven from the world above. We're really supposed to feel the free will and the freedom we're going to have other than the restrictions of the government. But guess what? You're going to have to pay triple for oxygen, which means you'll probably have no money to like participate in anything that you will want to do because you're going to be poor and then you won't have that free will to do things because you can't pay for things in Rapture because you spent it all on this month's oxygen. Like what? Okay. 
Sure. Did he advertise this as a part of like, oh, yeah, oxygen's only a penny for now. And then it goes up triple that. Like when people were moving to Rapture. I don't understand why people moved to Rapture. I'm sure that's what it was. I don't get it. Yeah. We get to the lab and we try to put the Lazarus Vector through the misting machine. But then we hear Andrew Ryan threaten us because we didn't get the memo of staying out of Rapture um, and his business. And I mean... Jack is pretty thick at this point because we've seen now two people die at the hands or like actually three if you include Atlas's son (laughs) at the hands. Patty. (laughs) Yeah. Patty. Oh, old Patty. Patrick. Patty (laughs) O'Reilly. Patty (laughs) O'Reilly. Andrew Ryan's right, I guess, to threaten us because we're not getting the point here. Uh, So he ends up sending us a bunch of splicers our way and we have to seal up the lab to try to delay them. So as you go back to the entrance of the lab, you'll conveniently see a switch that's labeled lab access seal in big old bold letters. I love it. Um, And pretty much that will help us delay the splicers, but it won't help you get them away from you for good. So you actually have to deal with waves of enemies. And I think the best way to do this is like if you hacked the bots earlier, it's actually going to shoot a lot of the splicers that are outside trying to get into the laboratory. Yeah. I do love the lab access seal feels very ex machina where it's like, Ooh, this is just here for <laughs> a us. huge sw- switch as well. It's like Weird. huge. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's huge. I love it. I really do like that. After you deal with these waves of enemies, uh, it's finally time to save some trees instead of saving ourselves. Well done, lad. Take a deep breath and enjoy it. Then head over to Roland Hill to get the atmosphere. Next stop is Ryan's house. It's time for blood. Why are you so resistant to the traditional methods of separating a man from his soul? You're not CIA, are you? You belong to Atlas, the one roach I can't seem to exterminate. Don't worry. I just need time to find the proper poison. So we saved the trees. And apparently our next step is to go to the metro station and pull up on Andrew Ryan at his house, um, which I don't think he's going to like. But what I'm happy to know is that he doesn't think we're CIA anymore. He doesn't think we're CIA anymore. But again, I still have my gripe with Atlas here. Every time (laughs) he talks to us, I roll my eyes because he's like, now we're going to go to Andrew Ryan's house. We're going to kill him. Yeah. And it's like, okay, like I didn't sign up for this, man. Like I'm just some guy who fell off a plane. (laughs) Just some guy that fell off a plane. Just trying to live my life. But yeah, I'm actually really interested in seeing Andrew Ryan, hopefully in person. He does threaten us trying to find the right poison to deal with us. But what if we actually meet Andrew Ryan and he's like, oh, hey, come in for some tea and crumpets or something. No, the tea will be poison. Okay. This man has every poison gas known to man. What if he's like, hey, come in. You totally got me all wrong. I thought you were CIA. You're not. Hey, you want in on this O2 business? This sounds like a Hansel and Gretel thing, okay? (laughs) Where, you know, trying to lure in some children with cookies or whatever the witch does and then turns to the witch. That's basically Andrew Ryan. You can't believe anything he's going to say. At the same time, I don't believe Atlas too. So it's like, here we are. I don't know what to do. I just want to get out. Which poison is worse? We'll never know. We'll never know. Well, if I find out that Patty O'Reilly doesn't exist, <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna punch Atlas for a new one. <laughs> punch Atlas. Uh, well, hopefully we'll be able to punch Andrew Ryan for sending all these splicers our way in person because we're going to finally be able to meet him on our next episode of Autosave. For now, we're going to dive into some diary recordings that we collected throughout these chapters. The augmentation procedure is a success. The slugs alone could not provide enough atom for serious work, but combined with the host, now we have something. The slug is embedded in the lining of the host's stomach, and after the host feeds, we induce regurgitation. And then we have 20, 30 times yield of usable atom. The problem now is the shortage of hosts. 
Fontaine says patience, Tannenbaum. Soon, the first home for little sisters will open, and that problem will be solved. The children, with their very long needles, their tuneless songs, their ghastly errands, their ghoulish Frankenstein fathers, but... We've all placed our hand on the great chain of endeavor. My hand is on it. Fontaine's is on it. We all pull it and are pulled by it. Yes, these children are an abomination. But it is not my hand alone on the chain that created them. No. Their little fingers were right there next to mine. So we know that when Andrew Ryan and Tenenbaum started working on this plasmid idea, they looked in how to utilize these slugs that they found uh, that provided Adam. But apparently we learn uh, in some of these diary recordings that the slugs work better when combined with a host. But the problem is, where are you going to find host? And that's where Fontaine comes in. The man who gets things done. It's actually pretty horrible, which makes me guess if I would want to side with Fontaine. But Fontaine says that he's going to use these little sister homes to find the host. So pretty much just abduct these little girls um, that will be in these homes and use them to, I guess, be host for these slugs. That's horrible. Were these orphans or were they stolen out of homes? Well, when you're... See, I'm not too sure. I feel like they may be orphans because when you go around Rapture, you hear like, get a little sister. A little sister is like, children are the future of blah, blah, blah. So I'm guessing they were also selling these little sisters to people. Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) I'm not. So like, were they orphans that were like put into this home, experimented on and then sold to the people of rapture because of their ability now for Adam. These recordings about the little sisters were so heartbreaking because you also even hear another one with Tannenbaum talking about how like, obviously these little sisters are in the lab. She's experimenting on them with plasmid and how to get their Adam. And one of them uh, tried to, I guess sits on her lap and she shoes the little sister away because she's seeing like the oozing of the eyes and like just how they physically change as an effect of this, the slugs. And she ends up realizing that it's not the little sisters that she hates. It's herself because of what she did to these young children, which is also why she wants to rescue them now. Yeah. Because she also notices like, I guess the effects of uh, the slugs is obvious in the physical appearance of the little sisters. But what she wasn't prepared for is how they are still children. They play, they sing and they want to be around a parent figure. And we also hear that echoed with Andrew Ryan as he talks about these little sisters. I think we hear a hint of regret coming from him as well because he's seeing that these these children are affected and it's not it, it's a hard thing. Like if you were in rapture and you're you're like little children are being experimented on. This is a hard thing to see. And it's interesting that we're getting Andrew Ryan's perspective of, of it because we hear him kind of regretting it and justifying the actions of using these little sisters through well everyone else is doing it like everyone else is involved in it right so that's helping him justify these horrific situations and we even hear him try to say that he asked the scientists like why can't they make the little sisters or the splicers not fully aware of like what's happening so they don't have that human element to them So after all of this, though, when you learn all of these things, it makes me want to rescue them even more so than I did before, because you're freeing them of this, where basically they're they're not like human at that point Mm -hmm. when they are from what we've we've explained. So it's just like you can rescue them and then they can become human again. Yeah. And they can have, you know, their lives back. So for me, if you don't rescue these little sisters then you're just a shitty person. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. 
and and you also hear that like change like with Tannenbaum realizing like she actually hates herself for doing these to little sisters and then you hear how she tries to help them but then because like so they don't feel anything or they're not aware of like what's going on so they're kind of like zombie-esque yeah but uh for science reasons, she's not able to do that because then it will change the effects of the plasma. So I found this really interesting because it was the first time we're getting a glimpse of like why Tannenbaum is doing what she is doing. Well, not the first time for her, but the first time for Andrew Ryan of like that hint of regret because he just seems like pure evil right now. But I don't think necessarily he sees himself that way, which leads to the great chain of control that Andrew Ryan talks about. We know that he created Rapture because the government and higher powers try to limit free will and that's his reasoning for creating this what he thinks is an oasis deep beneath the sea. I've always had trouble with understanding if he created this oasis then why is he also taking the free will away from the people and the citizens of rapture as well, like charging for oxygen or like putting, he's well aware of the size effects of using plasmid, the death, the insanity, all of that. And it seems like also the city, he's not telling the citizens the full information of it, um, which we could see in like when you're using the plasmid machines, they, they look, they're very adsy and like, they're not telling the full story. Right. And I think we hear in this recording for the Great Chain of Control that he feels pressure to do this because it's a a wartime between him and Atlas. Yeah, this whole like, I don't know, free will kind of this whole place, rapture in general. And I don't even know, like, what's the governing body? Like, who controls this? Does Ryan control everything? Like, is there a government in place? I'm, I'm guessing there's not. So he's in just in charge of everything. Yeah. So then it almost becomes like a dictatorship in a way where he's kind of just controlling every means of supply and demand and whatever. It's not even just about free will. Are people starving here? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the situation? Like, obviously, we know that it's dire because there's splicers and everyone's gone. Everyone's gone mad. But what was it before? Was there ever any sense of like peace in this place? It never felt like a utopia. If yeah. That's what they were trying to make it feel like when it first started. Yeah. But we don't know that kind of like backstory right now. No, we don't. And it seems like he's just because he's just diminishing when we first uh, landed on Rapture, what it seemed like it was supposed to be. He's diminishing that whole vision he had, but justifying it through other people's actions or other people coming on board with him. And then also this idea of like this war against Atlas and being threatened by Atlas and his group of bandits, which he calls Atlas's crew, which that's the other thing. Does he think bandits because Atlas is just going against him and trying to stand for the people? Or is this a subtle hint that Atlas may be as like as a a bandit, maybe as like, you know, a little bit, evil or have like his own agenda with Andrew Ryan that we have to also be aware of because they talk about heroes and criminals as well we hear Diane talk about that so yeah I don't know there's lots of questions and I'm really I really am waiting for that point with Atlas to find out what his MO is if things are so bad in a place and Andrew Ryan is such a bad leader Mm -hmm. it tends to like create these kind of people true that's true right who want to fight against whatever is going on. Yeah. Whether they think it's unjust or not. And I think that's the point with Atlas is everything that he's told us, although, you know, we don't believe him for sure, but he's trying to like change the situation of Rapture. So maybe it's for the better. Yeah. Maybe he does have, you know, good intentions. Maybe, or maybe he doesn't. Uh, One other thing I want to talk about is the idea of ghosts. Cause we brought this up like, in previous chapters, we'd be walking and we see like a figure yep. there. We have these flashbacks to these photos. What does it all mean? Well, in the diaries, we hear of, you know, this person, McDonough, uh, who revealed that Andrew Ryan, obviously aware of, of the side effects of plasmid. But one of them is also, I guess, having other people's memories in yours like pass through you by the, like the genetic sampling i'm not a scientist i have no idea but i guess the ghost we see are other people in rapture like we suspected and because of how the plasmid works we're getting their memories 
through our use of plasmid. So that's why we're seeing visions from Jack? Well, I think that's why we're seeing like the figures, the people. You know, like when we saw the nurse yes. with Dr. Steinman, that's why we're seeing the people. Okay. So we still don't have an idea of what the pictures represent. No, no. But the ghosts that we see, that's the answer. Okay, that makes sense. Exactly. So then that's why. It's all because of genes and science that we're seeing them, which is pretty interesting. And then I'm just wondering, like, does that have an effect on these memories, these visions? Or is Jack just so traumatized by being in rapture that he's having flashbacks to the life he once had? I mean, the picture we saw on the plane, we know that's that has to be his family. Or maybe it doesn't. Yes. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All I do know is that we are close to the end of our episode. Nick, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or touch on before we say our goodbyes? I hate Houdini splicers. I really hate them, too. And I hate bees. Oh, the bees. The bees. The bees. The bees. Ah! Uh, If you don't get that reference, uh, catch up on your Nicolas Cage movies. For now, we're going to actually be gearing up for hopefully a showdown between us and Andrew Ryan. But yet again, Atlas always changes the objectives of these things. So maybe we won't. Who knows? We'll have to find out next time on Autosave. Autosave is produced and hosted by Nick Andrade and myself, Camille Selzer Hadaway. The show is also produced by Dylan Wilson. Gameplay and additional elements provided by Chris Zeiser. Technical production by Kevin Hillsden. Executive producer, Clayton Hansler. You can follow the show at Autosave Podcast on Twitter and Autosave Pod on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch. You can subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it right now. And if it happens to be Apple Podcasts, kindly leave us a rating and a review, but only if it's good. Autosave is a Soda original hosted on the Soda Podcast Network.